Hey folks, you made it through topic one, which is a huge accomplishment. So welcome to topic two. It's going to be a little bit shorter and we're going to focus on antimicrobial resistance. So after selecting antimicrobials for use in the hospital or in the clinic setting, the second biggest concern is the development of resistance from these. So it's really important that as healthcare professionals, you understand how resistance is formed and what exactly it is. And that's what we're going to cover in this topic. Luckily, we only have three objectives this time instead of the huge list you had in, object in topic um, one, so make sure that you take care of these. But as always, if you have any questions or want to go over them, please let me know. I'm here to help you with any of them. So what is drug, d drug resistance? What is the development of these resistance? So as we mentioned, topic one, these antimicrobials that we've developed, a lot of them were originally isolated from other microbes because they are released to prevent other microbes from coming in and growing in their space. What that means is that there's a natural amount of this resistance in the environment, especially in environmental microbes. So the ones you find in soil or water or anywhere like that. That means that there is this propensity and this genetic availability of this information out there. So it's something that can easily be spread. It's not something that has to be mutated or come into existence. And these can be spread either through horizontal gene transfer or just the turning on of these genes develop depending on what the environment is. And so we saw how this happened um, when we talked about horizontal gene transfer. So if you need to refer back to how those methods are, go ahead and go back to chapter eight and look at that again. So resistance, though, we first started seeing this in 1940. So if you remember, we didn't develop antimicrobials until 1930. So as you can see, we didn't have a whole lot of a head start. And it's this perpetual arms race against these microbes. But in the 1980s, 1990s, this became a much bigger problem. And that happened because of over prescribing of antibiotics, the use of them in the food industry, things like that. And so that's where this has been a, such a big concern in the healthcare community. And as I said, this resistance is natural. So it's not something that is happening necessarily through mutations. It's just being passed because this already exists. And it's a defense mechanism these microbes have built up over the millennia to the other microbes. So how do bugs resist the, uh, the drugs? And there's about five different methods. So the first one is that they prevent the, mic the drug from actually doing anything by metabolizing it. They just break it down and make it harmless. So that's the first one, and it's kind of an easy way to think about that. They just have an enzyme, just makes it useless. The second one is how our viruses and our, our cells have evolved over the time, where we actually change cell receptors. So they have receptors that no longer allow this drug to enter through them. The third type is when, so the drug can enter in, but they pump it right back out. So they've gotten good at re recognizing what it is, and it pumps right back out of the cell. The next one is, so let's say it gets all the way into the cell and it reaches its target, and if we're targeting the ribosome like in this picture, the target is no longer present. So the cell stops making that target and has modified the way that that target looks so that the drug can't bind to it. And then the last type of resistance, this is my personal favorite, it doesn't work, the drug shuts down, they come up with another pathway to just work around it. So those are the five different ways that microbes can resist the drug. So make sure you're really familiar with these. This is something I really want you to know is these five different mechanisms. So how do we, what are we doing to combat this? This is a huge issue for us in antimicrobial therapies. How do we develop new methods? And so here's four of them listed here, but I really want to focus on two that I think is probably potentially the most interesting. And the first of these are using RNA interferences. Now, when we talked about RNA, we talked about how mRNA is coming out of the nucleus from transcription. What happens with RNAIs is these are complementary codes for those mRNAs. And if we release them into the cells, it will specifically target that mRNA bind to it and break it down. And so this gives us a much broader range of targets because all we have to do is have the specific sequence of that mRNA. More importantly, it's a highly unlikely that that mRNA sequence is going to be identical to ours. So the selective toxicity may even be improved. Another really interesting one is these bacteriophages. We know that bacteriophages are viruses that target only prokaryotic cells. So by using these to target the bacteria infection, then potentially, once again, our selective toxicity will go down for the host cells. So I think these are really cool. Um, and if you want to talk about them a little bit more, we can in class. So just let me know. Um, if you want to discuss these different therapies a little bit more, but there's going to be a whole lot more coming. This is a huge area of interest because of the fact that our current repertoire of antimicrobials is quickly running out. 
So the last thing, and we've been talking about this a lot this semester, is the microbiota and how important our normal flora is. And it's becoming more and more apparent and the researchers are paying more and more attention to this. And so with this, we've seen an explosion of probiotics and prebiotics on the market. I'm sure you've noticed them at the grocery store. There's all sorts of weird stuff that's got probiotics in it. Yogurt has always had probiotics in it. This is um, how it works. And actually, one of the when you look at the yogurts when you're going to buy one, if you're buying it for digestive health, you want to find one that has a variety of strains in it, as well as live culture. Some of them are not live. So if you're looking for that aspect of it, that's what you want to look for on the label. You can also always purchase them in pill form. And what probiotics do is that they can help redevelop that microflora in your body. And so what it can do, um, we've identified which strains are really helpful and we've introduced those into either yogurt or pills to help you reestablish those. And another aspect on how this can work is, I don't know if you've heard of the fecal transplants they do to treat C. difficile patients. What they do is they'll wipe out all the gut flora, including the C. difficile, and then they will transplant fecal matter from another healthy individual to that person to restore gut flora. And it's actually been really successful in the clinic. Another thing that we hear a little bit less about is prebiotics. And prebiotics are nutrients that encourage the growth of these microbiota. Generally, if you've lost your microbiota for whatever reason, there you either don't have the nutrients or there's something wrong with that environment. So you're taking a prebiotic can actually help those microbes reestablish within your gut or wherever we're trying to reestablish them. So that's the differences between those. So this is the end of this really short topic lecture on um, resistance, but based on the fact that we've already talked about horizontal gene transfer and we've hit this topic many times this semester, I expect that it should be fairly easy for you. The big thing to focus on are those five mechanisms of uh, resistance. That's really what I want you to focus in on for this topic. And as always, if you have any questions, let me know.